Well, John, that was really kind, but what else were you going to say? You are going to say that somebody else was the most popular speaker? <laughs> well, thank you. I love that. Ooh. Yeah, I need, we I may need never, longer legs. We may never get out of these chairs. I feel like Edith Ann, who remembers that show. Oh, okay. yeah. What an honor. So I got a call from Linda and John, and they said, would you come? And I didn't take but a second to say absolutely, because as everybody in this room knows, Myra is an extraordinary woman. So this was an easy yes, and I feel honored to spend the next 20 minutes or so in my big comfy chair here um, asking you some questions, playing journalist with you. Be fun. Um, I, are we supposed to start with a joke? I feel like I should, oh. you know, a, a, nun, a nun, a priest, and a minister walk in a bar, right? Or a philosopher, an attorney, or and a physician. Exactly. So let's start with that. Okay. Yeah. How, I, I know that your mother is involved, but how did you become involved with this issue? Many of you have heard this story more times than you wish to, but my mom died in her early 50s from a rare stomach cancer. We were new to Kansas City. We really didn't even know the name of a doctor when she first began to have problems. She died the year before hospice. The first hospice was started in the United States by Florence Wald at Yale New Haven. That? She died in 1975. And she was a rancher's daughter. She unfortunately died of the same disease that her mother had died of at about the same time in her life. She knew kind of what the trajectory was going to be for this. So she did it all. She had an experimental surgery. She did uh, experimental chemo. She did FU5 when it was in clinical trials. Uh, I won't tell you what she said the FU stood for. It was really, really dreadful. But when she realized that the drugs had not worked, the disease had won the battle that she had waged, she wanted to come home. And it was a very difficult thing to accomplish. Now that seems strange, but she was so sick and the medical community had invested so much in her. They just wanted to try one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. And I remember her saying to a, a young and very uh, well-intended gastroenterologist, she said, you poor dear, have they not told you I'm dying? It is time for me to go home. So we brought her home. But along the way, Lee, what, what I realized is that our failure to take proper care of those who are seriously ill and dying is not because doctors and nurses and social workers and chaplains aren't dedicated in doing everything they can do. It's really a cultural, or in some ways, cultural, because we were so death avoidant, but there were also systemic issues. Healthcare delivery system really wasn't set up to serve patients, or I would argue, those who work in those facilities. It was this big, complicated machine that had just kind of taken on a life of its own. So when my mom was dying, my mother was a woman of deep faith, a good Southern Baptist girl. And she said to me, I know you think this is awful, but God has a plan. So after she died, I had no idea what to do with all the time I had because I had really been a full-time caregiver for a few years. And I decided to go back to school and to study philosophy. And I encountered Hans Ophelman. And the very first day of class, he presented a case study about a 28-year-old man who was dying of lymphoma, whose young wife wanted him to be told everything. His parents saying, absolutely not. You can't tell him because you'll rob him of hope and the will to live. So boy, did I get hooked on bioethics just right away. And it has been a wonderful mechanism for me to live out my personal mission of trying to make things better for patients and families who struggle with serious illness and who struggle at the end of life, and those who care for them, who struggle also with them. I, uh, yeah, thank you. And boy, have you lived that mission out. 
Um, you just jogged a question for me because I do a lot of speaking, telling our story in a lot of healthcare situations. I want to know in that, what's in that cup, by the way. That's what you've been toting that around all I night. see. I okay. see. <laughs> Might be more, ladies and gentlemen. We'll find out later. Um, and I talk a lot about the importance of leaving the door open for hope and that mm. there is hope even in a terminal situation. So can you talk a little bit about how, where does hope intersect with what you just described, with someone saying, young man, don't you get it, I'm dying. Yeah. You know, there was a wonderful scholar at KU over in Lawrence. Some of you may have known him. His name was Rick Schneider. And his research was a, psych a psychologist, and his research was about hope. What is hope? And his writing was that hope is about having the ability to set goals and to work towards those goals. And when something happens that makes that impossible, to regal. Most of us have heard that term now. But at the time that I read his first work, I just called him and said, hey, I, I want to come and talk with you about end-of-life care and what you think about this tension there is around hope, the role of hope in care of those who are dying. So I went over and talked with him, and he said, you know, he had really never thought about it before. But the thing that I have concluded is hope is essential to all of us to have meaningful life. But the idea that to imagine that we're immortal is the only way we can hold on to hope is ridiculous. You know, I saw my mom hope that she would live to summertime to see our oldest daughter play softball. I saw her hope that she would live to see our youngest daughter swim in a pre-competitive swim game. She never lost hope, but she knew exactly what her fate was. So I think we have to help healthcare professionals understand their role a little more clearly, that they're not there to guarantee that we're going to come out of this alive, because none of us are. But to help us set goals that give our life meaning until the very last breath. I think it's critically important. Do you Do you feel like that tide is changing in medical school? Is that part of the conversation more? In, in your years here, your decades here? It is changing. It, there's no question it is changing. And you know, we, I think I probably said this to you earlier today, we do a lot of talking about patient-centered care these days. And it's kind of a buzzword in healthcare. And you know, there are trends in healthcare delivery like there are trends in anything. And a lot of times I really worry that that's kind of a vacuous term. You know, what do we really mean when we talk about patient-centered healthcare? You know, we've got a long, long way to go. Dr. Clay Anderson is sitting right up here at the front tonight, and Clay's been a real leader nationally and locally in palliative care and end-of-life care, and he and I were recently involved in a situation with a sweet friend of mine, and, you know, th there were really good things that happened, but there were things that weren't so good. We've got a lot of, of work to do yet, but yes, we have made a dent in this. It is better, but it is not yet what it needs to be. We're not there for patient-centered end-of-life care just yet. John, are you around? Okay, John, you're gonna take <laughs> us into that next phase. Um, talk about some of your biggest achievements. Well, or people keep asking me that. You I know, know it's, it's one like, of those like, this is your life questions, Lord, and but we need you to answer it. You know, I think, <laughs> When we first started, we were, and there are people in this room who were in that first cast of characters, and we were a cast of characters. We were zealots, and frankly, we were babies. I mean, this was 35 years ago. We thought we could do anything. I mean, we really, truly did. Somebody would say, you know, isn't it awful the way people with HIV and AIDS are being treated? You know, they're being screened without permission. Our local blood bank was mailing postcards to people telling them what their HIV status was. You know, we have emergency rooms refusing to... And we'd say, well, we can fix that. You know, we, we can get everybody in Kansas City together and talk about this, and they're all really good people, and they don't want to mistreat these poor people. And lo and behold, we would make progress. So 
I think the biggest accomplishment is that as a community-based center, bioethics center, it is still in existence after nearly 35 years, which in and of itself I think is a remarkable achievement. What was the turning point for you when you realized we're going to make a go of this? And not only that, but we're going to have a national impact on the conversation. Well, I think that was yesterday. <laughs> um, actually, um, the Cruzan case has been mentioned tonight a few times in the film, and, and then uh, Rosemary mentioned it. The Nancy Beth Cruzan case was a landmark case in this country. And we became, um, because of Bill Colby, the attorney for the family who is here tonight, we became well acquainted with Joe and Joyce Cruzan and with Nancy's sister, Chris, and her nieces. You know, we really became very close with them. And I've said the center has sort of steadfastly refused to take positions if an issue is political. And that case became highly politicized. So the family actually petitioned us with Bill uh, coming, with, coming to the center to file an amicus brief on three occasions. It's never been too hard not to imagine taking positions because we don't agree on much of anything at the Bioethics Center. I mean, as Sister Rosemary says, ethics is about arguing. I mean, it's about fighting. It's about arguing for what's right. But in that instance, we all believe that Joe and Joyce Cruzan had the right to decide their daughter's face, fate. But we refused three times, and I've thought from time to time about three times and the cock crows and all of that. But when ultimately that went all the way through the courts and back and forth and back and forth, and Nancy, uh, after she was buried, her family had a small life insurance policy, which at first they thought they would start a foundation and try to help other families. And it, you know, it was just really too much. But they came to us and they donated her life insurance to the center. And the good news is, um, it was certainly not the largest gift we've ever given many of you in this room have made larger donations to the center than was that gift. But that was the turning point. I thought, you know, maybe my mom was right. Maybe there was kind of a plan here. Maybe there was something we are intended to do. And, and, I'm, and a lot of you know I'm not a very religious person. So I'm not sure if it's karma or the cosmos or God in heaven that she wants us to do something. I'm not at all sure about that. But I do believe that this group of people who came together under the name Midwest Bioethics Center, who believed in ourselves, this thing about confidence, believed in ourselves, and we used to say to one another, if not us, then who? Who would be stupid enough to take this on? Who would have less to lose than would we? Because we didn't have anything. I remember after... Uh, the terrible events of 9-11 and the not-for-profit world, people who do the kind of not-for-profit we do, really took a hit because people were addressing more human needs than that. And I remember Mary Beth saying in a board meeting one day when, you know, we've always thought the doors were going to close any day. And she said, you know, we don't need to worry too much about this. We know how to do poor so we never had anything, so we didn't have anything to lose. So, um, you know, it has been, and I've said so many times, Lee, this organization, and this really ticks off some of the staff, it is magical. What I have seen this little ragtag band of housewives and philosophers and lawyers and doctors and anthropologists and social workers and do is beyond anything any of us could have imagined when we started this. And the good news is, I believe that the next phase of the center will be just as remarkable. It has been my chapter at the center.
And maybe you just answered the question, but out of hardship and adversity sometimes come greatest lessons and the most resilience. So lowest moment. Oh, dear Lord. Um, well, <laughs> I think we were too stupid to recognize them as they were coming along because we just thought we'd pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off. But I think it may have been, uh, um, again, at, we were running the Robert Wood Johnson program that's been referred to several times now, community state partnerships. And, you know, it was a big deal. We were given $11.25 million to give away to these statewide coalitions that Charlie talked about. And we were doing really good work. I mean, really amazing work. And we were kind of challenging, oh God, if there's anybody here from Robert Wood Johnson tonight, you did not hear this, but we were kind of challenging their paradigm because we didn't really believe wisdom was coming out of Princeton, New Jersey. We really believed it was boiling up from Okmulgee, Oklahoma, or <coughs> Birmingham, Alabama, or you know, Des Moines, or wherever. But we were doing really good work. And the foundation, like many foundations, Steve Rowling, found itself challenged because the stock market, remember, just tumbled. And so they made a decision that unless they had contracts with grantees to extend past, we, we thought we had three more years on our project. And they made a decision to wrap those projects up. So we had only a few months and we had two dozen grantees and we had another half dozen, um, we called them associates, so we never gave them any money, but they participated with us. And, <clears throat> Ted Hempy is here tonight, and I should make Ted stand up and, and own this. Um, we were in such horrible financial shape because we thought we had this, you know, really rich program for another few years. And Ted was at BKD then, and he uh, was overseeing the audit process. He was on the board then. He was treasurer. I said it was easy for Ted to be treasurer because we never had any money to count. So, you know, he'd just skip in every now and then and say, no, we're poor as church mice and I don't know how we're going to hold this together. But we were on a family vacation and Ted called me and said, I have seen the preliminary audit. And he said, basically, Myra, there's no way this organization will be alive in another year. It, it's, really, it's really over. And you need to think about wrapping it up. And I still remember the bridge we were on in Florida when I heard that and the girls were in the car. And Ted, with all due respect, I thought, screw you, Ted Hempy, we'll figure this out one way or the other. <laughs> and in one year, we went, we had a $500,000 deficit that year. Wow. A $500,000 deficit. Now, that ought to be testimony to the board of directors that we've had at the center over the years. Because by every rational, organizational structure, they should have said, close that sucker up, you know, move on, write some I'm sorry notes. And, but they said, let's do it another year and see if we can't. And at the end of the second year, we had a small return to mission. We never talk about profits, we just return to mission. So we just kept chugging. So I think that was probably the lowest moment. I can still remember thinking, I'm gonna be sick and my children are in the car and I can't really throw up while I'm driving across the skull's way. <laughs> but um, that was, you know, it was hard. It was really hard. What lessons have you taught your girls? And maybe this is a better question for them, but watching you as a mom, BK, must have been quite some. I have remarkable children. I have two girls. BK is a med mal defense attorney, so all you doctors settle down, but if you get in trouble, call her. She's really good, she's never lost a case. <laughs> <clears throat> Our baby is Brandon. Brandon is the co-leader at Eileen Fisher. Here, go if you wanna look like this, just go over and shop hey. with her. You're, you're but, rocking it. You know, they and my husband, Truman, who many of you know Truman. I've known Truman since I was 13 years old. Wow. 
He's really the best man in this room. There's no question. But the thing I hope that they have discerned from all of this, and they've made a lot of sacrifices. I still feel guilty about the fact that I didn't go with BK to the airport when she was going to London to study because I had a meeting with somebody that I thought maybe had some money that they might give to. <laughs> BK, did you forgive her? Have you forgiven her for that? Okay, good. My Myra, let that one go. Okay. You know, bless their hearts. They have folded envelopes. They have put up chairs, taken down tables. Sister Rosemary tells a story about one time. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Trudy. We had a fundraising event. <clears throat> My husband's a very reserved and shy man. And I made him wear a security guard uniform like he was with the, those armored trucks. <laughs> and he, he brought in this big fake check <clears throat> to kick off a fundraising campaign that I think Wynne Presson was chair of the board then. And I'm not sure he's ever forgiven me for that. <laughs> <clears throat> but I hope that they have learned that if you really believe in something, it's really worth sacrifice. And that um, what really brings joy, you know, people say to me, how do you do this work? My God, death and pain and, you know, my work is joyful work. My work is joyful work. That if you really believe in something, and you work really hard at it, that's worth more than anything else in the universe. So I've learned a lot from them. I've learned from them tolerance and patience and forgiveness because they have forgiven me. And I hope what they've learned from me is just stay course, stay the course if you believe in something. years from now, put on your night vision goggles and tell us in your dreams. I'll be looking up through the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll be looking down I, through the clouds. I, I need more than night vision the goggles. <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe that was a bad analogy. But in your dreams, give us the vision of what the center looks like in 20 years. What, well, what does the country look What do we look like as a country in terms of this issue? Uh, this is going to sound so bizarre, but I hope we see the demedicalization of healthcare. That we realize that this is, yes, the science and the clinical knowledge and the data and the evidence and all of those things are important. But what's really important is about journeying with people who are vulnerable, who are frail and who are trying to figure out how to make meaning out of what's going on with them in their lives. You know, my grandson George is with me, and many of you have been just bored with pictures of this child since the day he was born. George, stand up, honey. <laughs> no one is bored of pictures with now, George. Now, I want you to know that he has a black eye because he plays lacrosse at KU and he got popped in the eye with a ball. But you know, when I think about 20 years from now, I think about George. And I think about that you know, he'll be in his early 40s and that I hope he has a family and I hope he lives in Kansas City <clears throat> so he can come and tend me if I'm still around or visit my great darling just once a year. <laughs> but I would hope that healthcare looks radically different than it does today. That it's not about these big meccas, these big institutions, but it really is more about the social determinants of health. Are we a just society? Are we educating our children? Do we have clean air? Do we have clean water? Those are, do people really understand that they have value and worth? Because that's what makes for a healthy society. The medical, and I'm sorry guys, those of you who've devoted your life to medicine, but you know as well as I do, that's only about 25% of the equation.
what you do. And we've got to figure that out because we keep putting more and more money into the medical, the scientific, hoping that we'll achieve immortality. It's not going to happen. Let me just tell you, we're, none of us are getting out of here alive. So I would hope that we focus much more on social determinants of health and on living in a just society where my sweet George and his children can be proud of being an American and being served by the healthcare delivery system. This would give you an idea of, not that you don't already know, of why Myra is such an incredible leader for this organization. She has set her timer for 20 minutes somewhere in her pocket so that we don't go over time. How's that timer doing? I'm going to look real okay. quick. Because I have three last questions for you, really two. I, can we do look that? Let me look. Okay. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Okay. Wrong pocket. Hang on here. I'm going to check what's really in that ice okay. cream, guys. Okay. Yeah, you can have a swig. Okay. Let's see. Um, well, I'll ask you while you're looking. So I have two questions from the we audience. We have three minutes. Oh, jeez. We have I'm three minutes. Up. Okay. Two questions from the audience. And you can do these like, you know. I'm going to turn the alarm off. Jeopardy. Let's okay. do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> one was highs and lows of this dinner. You're not allowed to use me as a high because John already did that. As a cheap Highs and lows high. of this dinner. Mm -hmm. And someone already planted the answer for the Okay. Yeah. I I'm going to quote you. You can't. I'm no, no, excited. not for tonight. First time I met Lee Woodruff, let me turn this alarm off. First time I met Lee Woodruff, she took the podium and she said, I came to Kansas City and thought for sure we'd have steak. <laughs> And it's one more rubber chicken dinner. And I said to her... I'm so hearing about this steak all my life, let me tell you. Being from the I said, we're so poor, you're going to get chicken any time you come here. Yeah. We had chicken again tonight, so I'm so sorry we weren't able... Oh, and Myra sent me a box of frozen steaks afterward. I, I want you to know. I did. So. I probably won't send you anymore now because I'm retiring. I'm Please not going to have anybody. <laughs> No, but you know how to do poor, and that's, that makes me feel better about your retirement. I think the highlight of tonight has been to see so many friends and colleagues, some that of you I haven't seen for years, and you came. Um, that's been the highlight for me, without question. And the second and last question is, what next? And someone said that you make incredible crocheted pot holders and that you might be turning your attention to that. Is that not Are you not kidding tell you me? Was. Yeah. But I also heard that you are a fabulous <laughs> cook. I'm a really good cook. That's awesome. I, I, come over I was on Rachel Ray with really? Brandon, our wow. youngest daughter. Yeah, I'm a really good cook. Maybe. I am thinking about learning to crochet because our church is crocheting out of grocery bags, waterproof uh, mats for the homeless people. Wow. And, you know, we walk and we live over by Mill Creek Park and there's so many homeless people in our community. And if, if I can learn to crochet, and I don't know, but if I can, I'd like to do some of that. I'm working on a book <laughs> that my, and I might be calling you about this one, Lee. My working title is No Good Deed Goes Unpunished. <laughs> and my reason for writing this book, it's a memoir, is to help the American people, the American public, understand how convoluted healthcare policy is in this country. And that in fact, our physicians and our nurses and our hospital administrators really aren't running healthcare. Politics is running healthcare in this country. And it is in our rational self-interest to make sure that legislators, whether at the federal level or the state level aren't deciding what dosage of medication a doctor can prescribe, what medications they can prescribe, how long I can be in the hospital, whether or not and we have got to turn health care back over to the professionals. So that's really my purpose in writing the book. And you know, I I really quite intentionally thought I'm gonna do what I need to do at the center until June thirtieth. And then I'll think about that tomorrow. My mother was very Southern, and she loved Gone with the Wind. It was her very favorite movie. And she would kind of find herself in a box, and she would pull her scarlet O'Hara 
And she would say, well, I'm not going to think about that today because it would drive me crazy, so I'm going to think about it tomorrow. <laughs> so that's what I've done with my retirement. I'm going to think about it July 1st, and if any of you have ideas, call me, because I'm going to have a lot of time. <laughs> okay, so before we go, what didn't I ask you? What would you like to say? There's one more thing I would like to say, and that is that I want to thank the staff and the board. When we started the center, you know, a good board is really a make or break for a not-for-profit organization. You know that with the Stand Up for Heroes Foundation, your Remind Project. I mean, really and truly, guys, if you've got any extra money, send half of the center and half of it to Bob and Lee for the Stand Up for Heroes. You know how important board members are. I was too stupid to know what a powerful, amazing board of directors gathered around this idea, this vision, and that they just kept coming back in prominent people. The staff at the center, we have had so much fun. And people know that I, I like quotations and I like I, I can be very nostalgic. I had a letter this week from Robert Potter, who was one of the staff members of the center for years and years. He's in Portland, Oregon now. And he said to me, you know, every time we'd leave the door of the center, you'd say, exceed their expectations. Be better than they thought we would be. Do more than they thought we would ever deliver. And he made this beautiful comment that the center had exceeded everyone's expectations. Einstein said that, and back to this improv thing, which I'm still not quite sure I quite get it, but anyway, <laughs> that creativity is intelligence having fun. I have worked with the smartest people that I've ever known. I met Bill Bartholomew's nephew tonight, who's a doctor out at St. Mary's. Many of you knew Bill. He was an early board member at the center. I just can't tell you how smart that man was, how articulate. All the people that I've worked with have been smarter than I am. They have been just remarkable. And I just want to say thank you for tolerating everything. Thank you for working your butts off and being with me on this journey. It has been amazing. It's been so much fun. And I'm not gonna say I'm gonna miss you because I'm gonna be here and I'm gonna be doing something. And if I can help you, you whistle because I'm gonna be looking for some things to do. Thank you, Lee. Ladies and gentlemen, donors, let's thank Marla for exceeding our expectations.